Thank you very much, uh, David. Great pronunciation, by the way. <laughs> I'll try to do a similar job with your language. <laughs> if I fail in doing that, please raise your hand and I'll speak even slower or try to pronounce it better. I noticed already the, the, some similarities and but also some dissimilarities between your culture and ours in, the, let's say, the old world. Um, my similarity was last night after the scientific meeting that we went to the Irish pub. Like that. This similarity is uh, the way you spatially configure this room today. I like that too. And it was really surprising for me that uh, you start conferences like this at 8.30. Experience learned us back home. You, uh, well, we start at 10. <laughs> but maybe it's Two, way, two ways that evolution goes. I'd like to talk with you today about wildlife crossing structures, mitigation measures, and if we are doing the right thing with them. We've seen a great example this morning, Compton Road already, the pictures that David showed us. So you, you as well as we in Europe, are putting these structures in place, and I think that's a great thing to do. But I also think that the job is not done by putting in these uh, structures. Uh, of course, we can be proud if we build structures like Compton Roads, overpasses, or uh, the ones we have in Holland. This is one example in the south of the Netherlands. But the risk is that we think, great job, let's sit back and um, well, look for the next project. And I think we should keep asking ourselves questions should keep looking back at the things that we did and ask ourselves if all our assumptions, predictions we made beforehand, we put this, uh, before we put these things in place, if they were correct, or maybe uh, we need some adaptations, maybe we need some improvements. So my story today um, yeah, will be focused on the question, is uh, our strategy with all these mitigations measures in place, is that really the road to success? Let me see which button to use. <coughs> it's not a new story when I say roads uh, over here, but also in Europe. We, we have them and we build more and more. To show you the example of Holland, about 2.5% of the country is covered by roads. It's quite a bit of land. And um, the density is, is, is going up even every year. I think this is even an old number. We are reaching four kilometers per square kilometer road uh, in our country. And you can see a little bit, if you visualize it on a map, what that is doing in the country. It is also not very difficult to understand that if we keep on building roads, the same with railroads and canals, that we some problems, problems for biodiversity, problems for uh, nature. Barrier effect um, is obvious that if we keep building barriers, if we keep building roads, and we don't take any measures to, to, down, uh, uh, to take the barrier effect out, we will have situations like this. Wildlife mortality, even more obvious, through the landscape, Every, everybody knows dead animals on the roads. It's a problem. It's a problem for the animal, um, but sometimes it's also a problem for humans. Um, in this case, you will see you see a dead hedgehog on the road, uh, and a map of Holland with the, the results of a monitoring study from uh, 2000, where all the hedgehogs were uh, registered. And the estimation in Holland is that 100 to 300,000 hedgehogs are killed every year on the highways. It's quite a lot. But like I said, it's not only an animal welfare problem or a population viability problem. Sometimes um, it's also a traffic safety problem. Like uh, in this case, this is a picture from the United States. It's pretty dramatic. Um, 
I have to tell you the background of this picture is not that uh, the white-tailed deer was hit by the road. In this case, the white-tailed deer fell off an overpass or jumped over from an overpass and came through the front uh, shield. Not healthy, nobody died in this case. Um, I like to emphasize that, but that was because there was no uh, nobody in the passenger seat. But we have to think also from that perspective. And although you, you don't have large mammals, you don't have large herbivores or carnivores, maybe this problem is less evident for you. Uh, but I think also you have a big kangaroo problem that might damage, maybe not kill people, but damage property. A little theory, a little background. Um, in the past, it was a situation like this on the, on the left, big natural areas, even in Holland, although you have to go back a long way, um, continuous areas with viable populations, but we started to fragment the area. And all these populations were split up in smaller ones, and consequently, some of them didn't make it. They became too small, um, uh, there might be in a, a disease running through them or any other cause that uh, resulted in extinction of a local population. What we want at the moment is to, to save populations that are still there. <coughs> the best way to do that is going back to the old situation, to the one big continuous habitat patch with a great population inside. But that's not possible because we also need and we use space for urban uh, settlements, or agriculture, so the way back is not possible in many cases. But there is an alternative here, and that's to connect these habitat patches, to make sure that all these um, remnant patches are linked with each other, that animals can move in between, and when locally one of these patches, one of these populations dies out, <coughs> recolonization can occur and can revitalize the local. But we need policy to do that. We need to come up with a vision, with a plan from the existing fragmented situation to go to a situation on the right here where everybody, uh, everybody is connected again. And that's not easy because in my country, but also here I think, um, especially in the suburban areas, there are many barriers to deal with. Barriers to bridge. And even more complex is that many species are vulnerable or susceptible for rogues and their impacts. And they differ in all their characteristics, their biology. You have small species, large species, you have nocturnal and daily species, uh, reptiles, amphibians, even insects, even flying insects that are affected by roads, although you might not think that to begin with. So then the question arises what to do. The problem is complex, but we don't want to sit down, we want to do something. Well, this might not be the best solution. Uh, making a nice wildlife corridor across your highway uh, with the fences, um, you have to get out of the car every day of these days. It's kind of a hassle. Um, I don't know about your traffic intensity here, easily reach 125,000 vehicles a day. Um, so that will be busy at these uh, locations. All the traffic jams that this will cause. So um, it doesn't need many words to say that this is ridiculous. But if you think it otherwise, um, uh, the other thing, or the other way around, is also ridiculous. If you say, well, the animals uh, have to just go wherever better to split these two movement corridors and come up, come up with a real sustainable solution. Many solutions have been thought of. Uh, I'm not telling anything new when I say that most of the mitigation started with putting up road signs. Uh, I haven't seen them here yet, 